Loving God, in the way that you bless us each and every day of our lives, our offering is a sign of our appreciation of you. The way that you give to us, the way that you guide us, the way that you love us. Loving God, when we return our gifts to you, we are showing how much we appreciate and embrace the power of your love and ask that you take what we return to you and use it in accordance to your will. Guide us in how to apply these offerings so we can grow the kingdom in our little corner here of Waterford and reach out to the kingdom in the four corners of the world. We ask this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Okay. Uh, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. And then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They they brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I can see. Some of the Pharisees said, This is this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. The others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said that this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? They answered then, I have told you already and you will not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. 
You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You are born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he had said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Will you all pray with me, please? Loving God, in this hour and in this place, I ask that you grant to me the gift of preaching. That the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth bring glory to you, O God, my rock and my redeemer. And to your beloved Gad in this house today, I ask that you grant to them the gift of hearing that our time together be one in which we go closer to you as we go closer to each other in responding to our call to worship and serve you. I ask this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. My teaching today is going to be broken down into four acts. And as I go from one act to the other, I'll pretty much let you know. This was a long passage of scripture, but if you noticed, Jesus was at the beginning and at the end. The majority of the teaching and confrontation took place between the formerly blind man and the people of his community. Act 1. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. This begins the first act of this story. Jesus sees a blind man who survives by begging. Now, in our society and culture, begging is looked upon as a bad thing. But in the ancient Jewish world, begging was an honorable way to make a living because there was something about your body that infirmed you to the point that you could not do hard physical labor. In fact, Jewish law, Talmud and Midrash, basically said, make sure you always save a portion of what you earn to give alms to the poor. It was expected that you would give something to the people of the poor because God had blessed you, you should share your blessing with others. In this moment, Jesus does a very strange thing. He spits on the ground, makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and says, go and wash in the, pee of, in the, in the, in the pool of Siloam, which means to be sent. The blind man was sent to the sent to wash, and he came back seeing, and by this time, Jesus has disappeared. He is no longer in the story at this point. He doesn't come back until the very end. Now the formerly blind man's neighbors begin to argue with him, for they could not believe that he was the same man who had been born blind. He had begged for a living. Can you imagine the shock of having a world of darkness and only sound? The sounds created the imagery in your mind, and now all of a sudden you have faces to go with voices? How many people do we know do not look like their voice? I've met several. Imagine if you'd never seen them and now you see them for the first time. I can imagine the man being in a grand state of shock. And they're saying, are you the man? Are you the man? And he's saying, yes, yes, it's me. I'm the guy that was blind, but now I see. Once the people, though, recognize him, they begin to question the validity of his miraculous healing. Were you really blind, or were you kind of fooling us all this time? Well, who did it, they asked. Who changed you? Who healed you? Who changed the circumstances of your life? Some fellow named Jesus did this, is what the blind man says. Well, where is he now, the crowd asks. I don't know, son, the blind man. And I insert my own little cheeky response. I don't even know what the man looks like. We have a man who was born blind. 
He was born blind with seeing with his eyes. But at the same time, he was also born blind within his heart. For his being asked questions not only to visually recognize Jesus, but to describe the emotional and spiritual encounter that he had. He's being asked to identify the moment, the action, and the person from changed him, and he simply does not know. His heart is closed. He is unable to. He can't tell anyone what Jesus looks like, only that he was sent with mud in his eyes to have, his, have the brokenness of his body washed away in the, peel, in the pool of Siloam. He has obeyed the command that Jesus gave him but cannot explain to anyone who Jesus is and what he did to change his life. All that's changed so far is the fact that he can see. But the heart of how he receives and embraces and shares Jesus after that, that hasn't taken place yet. Is it really so different with us in our own faith journeys? We are believers in Jesus, and if we have accepted him as our Lord and Savior, if we have gone through the waters of baptism, then our brokenness has been washed away, making us new creations. If we believe this and celebrate this, pray about this, then we must also believe that Jesus has sent us all into the world to introduce people to Jesus, build relationships that are centered around Jesus, and to make other believers disciples and to make other disciples believers. Jesus comes into our lives, changes us, and then sends us out into the world to address the needs of the people like the blind man. We are sent to the poor, to the hungry, to the sick, to the lame, to the stranger, to the lonely, to the broken, to the lost. Like the blind man, we are sent but there are many times that we may not understand the one who sends us. We too are people sometimes, I think, with mud in our eyes, our messy lives, our family lives, our work lives, our social lives. There are times you can listen to the news and say, wow, what a mess the world is. I sit there and say, wow, what a world that needs a healing of Jesus but there comes Jesus into our lives, inviting us to wash the mud out of our eyes. He challenges us to keep not only ourselves clean, but the world clean as, all, as well. We know that we've been sent, but are not always convinced of the wisdom of the sender. We get put in places where we go, God, should I really be here? Or God, why am I here? But we know that we've been sent. We are hesitant to go sometimes where Jesus sends us, takes us to steps in the new directions that are foreign and uncomfortable for us. So we will find excuses to avoid Jesus' calling and instructions. Act 2. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. The Pharisees also began to ask him, how he had received his sight. Now, a little time has passed here. In the condensation of the verses, it's happening boom, 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 boom. This happens throughout a day. So they find the Pharisees and bring him to him. In this part of the dialogue, the man begins to see his life a little more clearly. He's beginning to understand. He's been thinking about it. He's been wrestling with it. The initial shock of seeing the faces and voices correlate is now washing away, and what's coming at him but the discomfort, the frustration, the anger, the shock of the Pharisees. He has to face the religious police of his time and place. He is now confronted with a hostile interrogation. The healing of his physical sight has occurred on a Sabbath day, a day that is meant to be kept holy and free of any type of work or labor. The religious leaders, you understand, were not only experts in upholding the law, but they were also charged with enforcing it. 
On a day like the Sabbath, they were the Sabbath police. If you were breaking any Sabbath laws, they would tell you. They would confront you. They would tell you how to atone for it. But in this particular occurrence, and I'm sorry, but this makes me laugh, the religious leaders have a bit of a dilemma. Healing the blindness, the brokenness of an individual is a really, really good thing. But they did it on the Sabbath. And that violated the fourth law of Moses. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Keep it set above and apart from the daily routine of your lives. Do not make it like every other day of the week, but make it special. Take a time to revere and abide in God intentionally to get you through the up and coming week. And at the same time, allow yourself to rest a little bit because life is hard and you need to be at a place to face it. I don't know about you, but when I'm done here, after the executive team meeting, my son and I are zipping out to Oakland Township to drop off a dresser to my sister. Then we're going to three stores to do our grocery shopping before I get home. If a Pharisee was here, he'd slap me upside the head. Well, I'm not the only one. <laughs> cool. I find the irony here, to be absolutely delicious. Because the authorities have to turn to the beggar and ask him to explain what happened. They pressed him in this way. And the man who earlier said Jesus was the one who sent him to wash off at the pool of Siloam now has a fuller understanding of who Jesus is. And instead of simply saying, Jesus, his understanding grows. He amplifies his definition by saying, he is a prophet. Now the Pharisees and the rest of the crowds would have understood the full meaning of the words the man who, by the man who was formerly blind. For a prophet is a person sent by God to the world with a message that would challenge and change the people's understanding of who they were and what they were supposed to be. In other words, it would be a challenge to realign our morals and our ethics. For many, that's who Jesus is. He is a moral and ethical compass. His message is about caring for those who need, but the message grows so much larger than that. It's a message that tells us to love our neighbor and our enemies, those who we'd spend a lifetime in opposition to. To some of us to hear this, this message can seem a bit idealistic, and to others, it can seem totally unrealistic. He is a high moral teacher. He is a prophet with a message from God. For many, that is the most brilliant spark of illumination said, shed on the question, who is Jesus? He is one with great idealistic and perhaps an unrealistic message. Act 3. The religious leaders a second time called the man who had been blind and said, Give glory to God for your sight. We know that this man, Jesus, is a sinner. The man who was formerly blind answered with a very plain and simple logic. I don't know whether he is a sinner or not, one thing I do know is that though I was blind, I now see. In other words, if this man were from God, how on earth could this have happened? In that statement, in that moment, in that act, the blind man has elevated Jesus to a very high holy, respectable position in the eyes of the ancient Jews and the ancient worlds. First, Jesus sent him to the pool to wash. Second, he is a prophet. And now he basically says that he is from God. From God. Intentionally sent by God into the world to change the world. 
This is a declarative statement. And in all of the understanding that he's had so far of Jesus, and with the company he's being confronted by, the stakes have just gotten much, much higher. For he has overstepped his authority as someone who is not trained like a Pharisee. It is one thing to say that Jesus was a moral philosopher or a teacher, but now the prophetic message seems to be idealistic and unrealistic. It has now become a great, powerful message from God. How can you question something that is sent from God in the Pharisee's eyes? We can dismiss the rantings of an idealistic and unrealistic expectation by some self-appointed prophet on the street, I remember as a teenager having people doing mall ministries where they would walk up to me while I was at Oakland Mall and saying, you know, Jesus died for your sins. Whoa. We can basically say, that guy's a nut for Jesus, but he's a nut. But here is a miraculous act right in front of them. How can they deny that? They can say that his message is that of a dream, but it's more than that. Because when you say it's merely a dream, then you're saying that God is naive about the world and the universe that he created. We're saying that God doesn't understand our pain. We're saying that God doesn't understand how unrealistic it is of giving our lives in service and devotion to him. But the message cannot be so easily dismissed when it's coming from Jesus of Nazareth. And it can't be easily dismissed coming by someone who has been touched by Jesus of Nazareth. Because you had a person who was broken and is now whole through a miraculous touch. You had a man who is now growing in his belief and understanding that he has been truly touched by the divine. Are we able to join the blind man in believing and receiving Jesus' message? That it's not merely from the Son of God, but from God himself through the Son? Are we able to do that in our journeys? Act 4. Jesus now reappears at the end of this passage. After having been absent from the story since he sent the blind man to the pool... Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? And Jesus said, You're looking at him, Jack. I'm the one speaking to you. He didn't blink an eye. He didn't take a breath. There wasn't a pregnant pause for him to ponder. He immediately responded, Lord, I believe. And he took that moment, and he bowed down, and he worshipped him. First, Jesus is the one who sends us. Next, he's teaching us new morals and new ethics. He becomes the one with God's message, and now the formerly blind man has spiritual insight. He is now able to see with his eyes and with his heart. Jesus is not only the person that has brought God's message. He understands that Jesus is the message itself. A number of weeks back was Christmas season, and it's traditional that we talk about the birth of a baby with the title Emmanuel, God being with us. Not just a man, not just a prophet, not just a person who has insight into God's ways and purposes, but Jesus is being God with us. The formerly blind man worshipped him. Messengers Prophets are not worshipped. They consistently point their message and direction to get focused and get right with God. But Jesus is saying, I am the one you've waited for. I am God himself. The formerly blind man worshipped him. Moses, Isaiah, Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Hezekiah, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Micah, Nahum, Jonah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, John the Baptist, Paul 
Paul of Tarsus, James Bolin, Paul Prakaska, none of us should be worshipped. We are the messengers, always pointing to our God. But we should always worship the message itself. God the Father, through God the Son, staying with us through God the Holy Spirit. The Gospel writers recorded a story of enlightenment that holds just as much power and relevance today as it did 2,000 years ago. The one who formerly couldn't see with his eyes or his heart now sees clarity, the light of the world in front of him, filling him, healing him, guiding him. Can we make the same claim in our own faith journeys? How easily do we see the light of the world in our lives? How easily do we see the light of the world in the lives of others? How easily do we see the light of the world inside this church that we come and worship in? If the answer is that we struggle to see, then I, then I suggest that you allow Jesus to spit on the ground and put some mud in your eyes and glide you to a place of clean and clear vision. Who do we say Jesus is? Sender? Teacher? Or do we say that he is God himself? My prayer for you as you continue through this journey of Lent is that Jesus will wash your eyes so that all of us can see when we celebrate Easter. Will you pray with me, please? It is so easy to get sucked into the cliche that Jesus, you Jesus, are merely the Son of God. We overlook the fact that you were divine. That God created you to be part of you and he sent you for us. Not merely to save us and wash away our sins. Can we say, oh yes, I believe. But so that we can take that belief and make it who we are are, with every thought, with every word, with every act of intentionality and every act of accident. Wash our eyes so that we may see. Loving Jesus. Amen.